This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 906, recorded on Wednesday, December 21st, 2022. This Week in Science, top 11 of 2022. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on the show, we will fill your head with a list full of science. But first, thanks to our amazing Patreon sponsors for their generous support of Twists. You can become a part of the Patreon community at patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Time goes by so fast. Blink, and you won't miss much. It goes by slower than that. But as each day ends, another begins pretty much right away. Pace is relentless. And in the world of science, that relentless pace leads to an abundance of new discoveries. Each year, we attempt to share with you the research highlights, several hundred stories of sciencey goodness, stuffed into a podcast stocking hung on every Wednesday with care. And every year around this time, we pluck out 11 stories that we think are the most interesting of all. And remember, the year that was is soon to be no more. That then uh, reminisce with us for a while here on This Week in Science, coming up next. The kind of mind that can't get enough I wanna learn everything I wanna fill it all up With new discoveries that happen Every day of the week There's only one place to go To find the knowledge I seek I wanna know what's happening Kiki and Blair. And a good science to you too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of Twist. We are here actually not doing just another episode. This is one of our special holiday yearly endeavors into the year past. We are looking back at the year that we've just experienced so that we can all be reminded of some of those fun stories, the important stories. We're not going to talk about the boring stories, but I mean, we never do. So let's get into it. Blair and Justin, thank you so much for joining me once again for this very special, auspicious occasion. It's this year in science instead of this week in science. That's yeah, right. But isn't that a different show? No. I guess. Uh, it's this show right now. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the episode. <laughs> Yes, this is the episode before you, and welcome everyone to this wonderful episode of This Week in Science. We hope that you are here with lots of holiday cheer to endeavor with us down memory lane. Now, Justin, why is it top 11 again? Well, it used to be a top 10, but then we would get all of these uh, phone calls and emails, people asking us, well, what would have been the number 11? Was it this? Was it that? Everybody was so curious. So we added the 11th one on so that nobody would uh, bother us. Although I have received a few emails asking what the 12th one would have been. So that seems to be an ongoing ongoing problem. We might have to it's add one. Cycle. Yeah. <laughs> we'll just keep adding more to the list. Here just the... every decade, we'll add another one. It's not... We're just going to talk about all the stuff. There we go. I mean... And really, when we talk about our top stories in top in in science from the past year, it's more of the top topics in science. Very rarely does it come down to just one particular finding, because as we know, science is built on the shoulders of giants, right? Everything is a collaboration. Everything is based on what came before. And so very often one study is not, it's great. That's awesome. But it's not necessarily the one thing that's going to change the world. There are other things that have happened. So really, we're going to talk about a lot more than 11 stories. We're going to talk about 11 of our favorite big topics from the year. And so as we jump into the show here, I do want to remind you all that if you are not yet subscribed to us, 
as a podcast. We are found all places podcasts are found. Just go look for This Week in Science or Twists. You can also find us streaming live weekly Wednesdays at 8 p.m. ish Pacific time on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. We are Twist Science on Twitch and Twitter and Instagram and now on Mastodon, but I don't remember what server I signed up for. So it's on there <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> Does that matter? Because it, then it is, is, it, is it a bunch of little mastodons that you'd have Baby. to pick the right one? Like, I don't it's get a, it. It's a federated it. universe, Justin. We're learning as we go. But yes, uh, we are we are now Twist Science on Mastodon. And, um, you know, if all this is just too much for you to remember right now, just go to twist.org. That's where our show notes are. Our, links to past shows and subscriptions and all of our social media stuff so are we ready to dig in yes let's do it yes we will start the countdown at number 11 11 11 11 11 11 11 11 11 11 11 11 number 11 this year is climate change it's uh, it's got to be on the list. We talked yeah. about it. I do believe every single week, the entire <laughs> yep. year. Yep. Uh, but I would say it's not yeah. further up on the list just because I don't know if there were any great scientific breakthroughs that we were super blown away about. Just lots of bad news for the most part. <laughs> we hit 420 um, parts per million in the atmosphere for carbon. Uh, fish are in trouble some fish are gonna be okay but lots of fish are in trouble birds are in trouble bugs are in trouble we report on all that the siberian peninsula is the hottest it's been for seven thousand years droughts all sorts of stuff like that there were a couple kind of silver lining things we've reported on the show one is that um americans on the whole are excited about climate action and want to put climate action mm -hmm. forward. The caveat was most Americans think most Americans don't want that. So, <laughs> yeah, that was an interesting find. Like, yeah, they thought their to, idea was unpopular. Yeah, we need to and talk more about it. Yeah. It, and it probably mm -hmm. just is reflecting because it seems like a really important thing, but it's never in the news. It's not yes. talked about yeah. on any of the cable nation, national national uh, news networks. Yeah. They well, like and, um, almost don't mention it. We also reported this year that uh, the president of the United States had a State of the Union. He mentioned yeah. climate change twice. Not we enough. would have liked more. But <laughs> hey, uh, not that yeah. many years ago, it wasn't discussed at all in the presidential debates for the True. entire presidential run. So there's yeah. definitely progress. But what we've learned is it's bad. We need to talk about it more. But as Kiki reported one week, we need to keep solutions in mind and yes. give people hope. Because otherwise, there's no point in fixing things. So, <laughs> so hopefully, we'll see some better news in the future. Guaranteed climate change will be talked about a lot next year. Um, but hopefully, we'll have some really cool solutions and some policy changes to talk about. Too. I did hopefully. But I also, but I do always have to counter this. Because I don't want people to be too hopeful. <laughs> yeah. to be hopeful to the point of thinking yeah, so so it's, it's the the fun. i have a handwritten sign in my office that says it's good uh, or sorry it's real it's bad it's us there's hope mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah and i think that's the the big the big trick here is trying to get news big media to cover it in that way yes Everybody knows it's here. Everybody wants to talk about it. We all agree about it. And what can we do about it? What are the big steps to take? What are the things that we're understanding about it? Like fossil fuel companies, just I think today there's a report that uh, the first lawsuit going against propaganda spread by uh, fossil fuel companies uh, is is has been put into play. So really naming fossil fuel companies and their efforts to to cause misinformation so disinformation and basically lead you know to the propaganda that has led us to be basically a couple of decades behind in our efforts to do anything so well and because ultimately are working scientists are working technology is working we're all doing this we just got to keep doing it we yeah and and we talk about it like it's a tomorrow problem but more and more the science are reporting it's a now and yesterday problem we are seeing the effects now of climate change from 10, even 20 years ago. So um, yeah, I, I'm really hoping this is great news. 
<laughs> I love to hear that. There being <laughs> some actual accountability. Yeah. Here's hoping that climate change will be on the countdown next year with some really good progress. Yeah. And just keep in mind, last time we were, would you say 420 parts per whatever it was? Yeah. Last time we were there, there was no Mastodons ice were around. Oh. <laughs> there was, there was no ice on the caps last time we were yeah. there. It was, that was Megalodon, giant sharks. Yeah. And that's, that number is uh, 50% higher carbon in the atmosphere than before the Industrial Revolution, uh, the 1900s. So we're, we did this in 100 years, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We can mm -hmm. undo it. We got the technology. Just, just slow it down. It would be nice. Just... I'll settle for slow it down. <laughs> tap the brakes, everyone. It's okay. It's all right. I actually get worse gas mileage when you do that. So we are just, <laughs> just contributing. Oh, <laughs> Unless, of course, you're using a Prius or a hybrid car where you're tapping the brakes, you're regening yeah, your battery. Sure. So. Yeah. There you go. Mm -hmm. I want my regen brakes and better batteries. This is what we all need moving forward. Are we ready for moving forward down the countdown? Yes. What's One next? One more number 10. Number 10. Number 10. Yeah, I know. Last week, two weeks ago, I was like, Psh. We're not going to talk about the National Ignition Facility and fusion finding, and it's not going to be on our countdown and blurt to blurt to blar. But okay, it's on the countdown as part of the category for big physics and the work that it's doing in coming into creating some really interesting findings and moving us forward as a society and hopefully promising us a better future, right? So National Ignition Facility, NIF, uh, DOE's Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory Facility uh, achieved ignition this year and not just achieved ignition, but it uh, by a factor of 10 improved its ability to create a, a hot plasma uh, that was ignited, that had fusion. Um, and while, and this was above 2021's standards, so we're getting there, we're moving forward, improvements on the lasers, improvements on the technology is going to lead us in the right direction. And the fact that in a year, it was a times 10 improvement in what they had achieved from last year, that is substantial. So good work. Keep working. We're all waiting for our fusion. I want to. I'm, I'm waiting for the Europeans, not just not just NIF, but the Europeans with their ITER and some of the other tokamaks and the stellarators and others to come online. I'm waiting for all of you, all you all to make it possible. Um, in the kind of boring but whatever big big physics news, um, Large Hadron Collider, always one of our favorites, right? They're colliding particles constantly, huge amounts of data, massive experiments. It is kind of boring because once again this year, the LHC has said, darn it, there's nothing special. Standard model <laughs> still doing its thing. <laughs> that was a very recent finding this last yeah, week. Yeah, so there's apparently some gray yeah. area on the edges of, of some experiments that they thought might mean there's a different uh, the standard model isn't complete it's not correct there there needs to be an adjustment to make room for these and then now after some really intense experimentation at the lhc eh, everything we, we <laughs> needed to know we learned from einstein and we should just stop Physics know, is done. standard like model that's, good. that's where we are <laughs> That's it. Yeah. But, you know, there are still the other, uh, the Gaia, ex Gaia experiment had some data. There are other experiments looking at other things that are related to the Hubble constant and others that will potentially be giving us better information related to some of the more big scale uh, cosmological aspects of what we're looking at physically. And then, you know, big physics, but on a small scale, we had uh, one of Blair's favorite stories this year, the black hole in a lab, where researchers created a little teeny, teeny, tiny black hole that started having the little hairs of 
releasing energy and, and information just like they should be, according to Hawking and uh, other physicists' predictions. So, so amazing and awesome yeah. in the actual meaning of that word. And, awesome. <laughs> and also <Yeah>. terrifying. <laughs> But it's like a little little baby black hole. Know, it's not it's terrifying. We don't, we don't it's just understand con- them yet. Yeah. So like, what are you gonna do? It's scary. You're you're doing a thing you don't fully understand in a lab. They understand it. They, us. It's fine. They so tamed those black the holes. Analogy. <laughs> here's, the, here's the analogy that you can use. Uh, a a black hole works kind of like height. If it's really big, you have a reason to be afraid of being up so high. If, on the other hand, it's smaller than you, you have no reason to be afraid of that kind of height Okey-dokey. of falling down into or onto or whatever. All right. It, it's not it still makes to, me nervous. Yeah, but yeah, but I, also, I also am very much in favor of it. It's a very weird dichotomy. I am being torn apart from within because I'm like, that's so amazing and it's so cool. Oh, also, kind of spaghettified? Yes, spaghetti. Like, you can say that. <laughs> you're being spaghetti yeah, yeah. Um, In addition to black holes, little tiny black holes, there was also the... Yeah, this is the one that was debated as to the terminology and exactly how important it was. But I thought it was very interesting and wonderful advancement all the same because of the technology and... Um, the math working and it's really you know it's application as opposed to just theory it's just showing that things are right but the holographic wormholes so using quantum computers to be able to create uh not a real wormhole no we don't have real wormholes but these uh these simulated holographic wormholes that have a lot of the properties in common with what we would expect a wormhole to have um and some interesting outcomes to the experiment that had not been expected related to um, how they add the information was transferred from one end of the wormhole to the other. And speaking of sp- spaghettification, that there was a kind of tearing apart of or entropic factor related to information going in and then a more, uh, a more lo- not logical, but uh, less chaotic factor for the information coming out. So it was torn apart and then put back together, kind of like an egg being uh, unscrambled and scrambled or scrambled and then unscrambled. And um, some aspects of these holographic, hard holographic worm forms. Ever tried it. Is... <laughs> I've never tried it at home. No, I have not. Yes. Anyway, really interesting work. Amazing uh, use of quantum computers to be able to advance our understanding of physics, which this, I mean, if we want to understand our universe, right, the the theoretical physics being put into application, I mean, it's still simulation in a computer, but maybe that's what we are anyway. So it it all comes back home in the end. We're all going to... The only problem I have with that, the only problem I have with that is it seems like an evolving theory because I remember, I'm old enough to remember that people thought, Oh, what if we're all just uh, on a telephone line and don't realize it? And before then, they were like, "Oh, what if we're all just in a telegraph machine?" You know, whatever the nervous. Oh, technology you you re- really you helping. remember you remember back that far? Wow, you get older every well, no, week, th- Justin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, what if the all of reality is just part of part of a clay tablet that uh, somebody's written something on? Oh yeah, yeah that's a theory. You know, it's getting more convincing with the computer, but it's still just writing. It's all it is. It's still just writing right on the wall. Little little shadows written on the wall. But I think we will move forward to our next topic from these amazing, incredible physics applications and discoveries to number nine 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 nine, nine. nine. microbiome nine. Ooh, we love the microbiome why is it number so, nine justin this is, one, this is one because there was a bunch of stories as they kind of almost is again sort of like uh, climate change and a lot of these things that keep showing up in abundance each year 
uh, or they just catch our attention, perhaps. But the one thing that I thought was interesting is there was multiple stories, one at the beginning of the year and a di completely different one right towards the end of the year, and another one somewhere in between that were linking uh, energy levels to your microflora. The very recent one where it's the mice and they looked at their genetics and they looked at every, every, their diet, they looked at every possible angle and the only thing they could differentiate between the exercising uh, vigorous mice and the lazy mice was that their microbiota was different. And it's, it's kind of nice that they, that one looked at it through genome and everything else because there was a couple earlier ones that had connected it to, oh, maybe this is affecting personality. You know, maybe there's, there's a, it's affecting that more outgoing personality or a more reserved laid back personality, which is one way of looking at it. But if it's energy levels, if it's ability to keep running on the treadmill, then there's, then there's a probiotic that we should all take to get off the couch when we need to. I love that. <laughs> get off the couch. Take your bacteria. Let's do it. Yeah. I will also throw in my favorite your microbiome story from yes. this year, um, which was linking uh, being able to identify con people who'd suffered concussions based on their microbiome. So it's, yeah, essentially their microbiome shifted if they had chronic concussions. That mind-brain connection is becoming uh, much, much more clear uh, mm -hmm. with every passing year. There was another one too where this wasn't microbiome, but it was gut related. It was sensors in the gut that were reading different types of lipids or looking one that looked for lipids and sugars and one that just looked for lipids. And they, they tricked these mice, it sort of, I guess, tricked, but they had this tasteless water they could drink that had a lot of uh, lipids in it. And then they had another one that was really sweet that they liked. And they eventually all moved to the lipid one. And it turned out because the sensors in the gut were telling the brain, this is the good stuff. This is what I'm getting rewarded with. Yeah. So it, the taste uh, for those lipids wasn't in the tongue. These these mice were actually tasting the food to, and rating it from the gut. And the brain knew all along, but just never, never mentioned it to us. Sometimes, though, like with uh, artificial sweeteners, you might taste it sweet, but then you're, it's your gut which is one thing we determined this year, that there are different pathways within the uh, the vagus that go from the gut to the brain that are related to the microbial responses of to these various sweeteners, real sugar, artificial sweet sweetener, and which pathways get activated by metabolites. So sometimes it's like, oh, your mouth is like, oh, it's sweet. That's great. Let's start the sweet processes. And then your gut goes, mm -mm, no. Still need more. It's faking on me. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, you, you tricked the tongue. You didn't trick the gut. The gut uh, still wants you to go out and get some Krispy Kreme donuts. That's right. What else did microbes do? There was so much. Ah, those are those are the ones I brought to to talk about tonight. Oh, but there those were your big ones. <laughs> You're like there, there were more, more. <laughs> yeah, there were a lot more. There was actually, there was so many that uh, at some point, I think I stopped. I was like, I can't do another microbiome story this week. I know there was a study on, on I think it was apes, um, where comparatively looking at their microbiome and ours, it looks like we lost half of our microbiome when we moved to the city. Yeah. That was oh, yeah. One. There was city versus, uh, there was city versus rural uh, was part of yeah. that. Yeah. And there was also some involved in longevity too. Like people were living uh -huh. longer with different yep. microbiomes. So yeah. we're going to find out that all of the secrets to a long and healthy life. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I have to do with the gut. It's, and I, I still think, think it's crazy we, that doctors, that medicine has not caught up and said, let's get your blood panel and your microbiome <laughs> so that we have a baseline on you. I, yeah. I, I, that's what we yeah need. Nobody's ever looked at my microbiome to see what's going on there. No. It's, it's yeah. true. So this was also the year that we interviewed uh, Bryn Nelson about his book, Flush. And we talked about uh, which something that I think Blair was very excited to hear, yes. uh, that people who are lactose intolerant, that when you eat yogurt that contains the lactobacillus species of bacteria, you can eat cheesy things. So <laughs> if you're eating yogurt that contains things that eat lactose, your microbiome is being populated 
for have you that tried moment. It? No. <laughs> we must do these experiments. It's too high we have stakes. to do <laughs> too high stakes. <laughs> I'll get back to you. I'll, that'll be a resolution for 2023. I'll try it out. Oh my goodness. Okay. All right. Well, moving on from the microbiome, we will jump to number eight. AI, which stands for amazing impulse. No, it's not <laughs> artificial intelligence. Uh, of course. So there was a lot. There was a lot of AI this year. This was the year for AI. It, was it like, really was. It exploded. Um, first of all, there were art bots. So if you were on social media, if that's a thing that you enjoy, you saw lots of Midjourney and other ai programs creating art it's still it's still happening it's pretty well um we also had ai outperforming humans at things like uh detecting whale songs and um picking up information people missed in other studies uh detecting exoplanets with gravitational lensing um have being better at protein folding <laughs> coming up with algorithms just a lot just a lot of things but also ultimately proved that it could kill everyone oh, geez <laughs> what <laughs> no it um, didn't yeah Did well, it, wasn't it, 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 we basically it? fed it the information so that it could make a biochemical weapon if it wanted and essentially right. did and it did <laughs> Sure. Not good. Um, so, you know, th there was also a study about uh, the fact that AI has bad bedside manner. So there's more research that needs to be done about <laughs> language choice with AI. Which I'm not surprised about if you see those AI generated scripts. It's very clear language is not the thing AI is great at yet. Um, but yeah, AI was all over the place. And also, I will I will say anecdotally, a lot of my animal corner studies were conclusions were drawn because of AI systems. So they might have done research out in the field, collected data, come back to the, the lab, and then used AI to process that data to come up with an actual finding. So pretty game changing. And I will I will add a jump on here. Patrick Pecoraro is jumping into our chat and saying many times, let's not confuse artificial intelligence with machine learning. And so I think actually you're you're right on there, Patrick. And the what we are looking at in all of this stuff is machine learning. They're algorithms, they're given a big data set, and the the algorithms then go about figuring things out. Um, and so this is machine learning. This is not technically tech it's yeah, technically it's it's yeah it's machine learning there's either there's natural language learning processes there's various uh, aspects of how it's approached um well yeah. and it get i think it gets it gets more foggy when yeah. you look at things where the the program makes strange jumps like creating yes. uh, a biochemical weapon when given information on how to how to cure disease <laughs> well yeah <laughs> So this, is, this was a company. This is a company that only does uh, uh, machine learning algorithms to to come up with helpful com uh, compounds mm -hmm. that can be used in medicine. And they got invited to a, 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 some, a do a talk about how AI could uh, you know be turned against this. Like, what's the down? What's the evil side? What's the dark side of it? And they 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 didn't really realize why they were being, or they didn't know why they were being invited. So they go, well, let's let's see if we can take all of the buffers off, and and actually see if we can tr have our system if it would if our algorithms would tell us how to hurt somebody. Yeah. And it came up with all the known nerve agents that have been mm -hmm. outlawed and banned from war, and it came up with a bunch of ones that we haven't discovered yet. Yeah, and it not did good. it yeah. really quickly. Yeah. Very quickly. They move really fast. I mean, this year was the year that the uh that AlphaFold and also another uh research organization's open access uh protein folding where they were able to create ac very accurate 
protein conformations, the folding conformations for many, many proteins were removed, not just from proteins, but to other parts of, uh, of RNA, DNA, other aspects of, uh, of, of the cell and how they're put together. You know, this year was the year that not only on the bad side, there was an antibiotic that was created by artificial intelligence. So it came up, our AI, machine learning, came up with a whole bunch of, well, really bad things for humanity, very quickly, <laughs> nerve agents to kill us, but it also came up with antibiotics that would potentially help save our lives. So yeah. there, there's the good side, there's the bad side. And this is, this is, I think, where we have to be looking at this, this technology moving forward with all of our faculties as humans towards creativity, toward, towards intelligence, towards what we expect from, uh, from computers. The algorithms are just going to get smarter. They're going to collect more and more data. The more data they have, the better their predictions can be. Um, right. Yeah, maybe we will have a sentient computer by 2045 or 2060 or whenever it is that various people have predicted that we'll have super intelligent uh, artificial intelligences. But at this point in time, we have some really cool machine learning algorithms that are doing some neat stuff and they're giving us an opportunity to take a look down the road at where mm -hmm. things are going to go. We have and some do neat... science faster too. And do science faster. Yeah. yeah. Very, very good point. Oh. Yes. And also maybe know what to wear when you go to Soho. Oh yes. I didn't Tokyo. talk about that one. No. Oh man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And an AI machine learning uh, system basically was fed a bunch of fashion information was able to give suggestions on what to wear <laughs> what should you wear if you're going to paris what should you wear I if you're going know. to soho i would not trust <sighs> it's probably nothing that's in my closet anyway so <laughs> <laughs> we will just keep on moving on have we talked machine learning ai out mm -hmm. talked it out okay mm -hmm. We're going to be creative on our own. We don't need AI. I actually tried to ask ChatGPT if it would predict the top 11 science discoveries of 2022 for me. And it said it couldn't because its information only went up to 2021. So it could not help me. Aww. Oh, it's learning library wouldn't help it make predictions. I was sad. I thought that would be kind of a fun way to start this show. But maybe well, next check year. 2021 against our 2021. See how accurate yeah. it was. <laughs> We'll check it. We'll check it. Number seven. Let's talk about brains and brain organoids. Oh, the neuron and brain research. Little tiny baby brains in dishes doing so many very interesting things. This year, researchers got uh, neurons in a dish that they created. They called it dish brain. That's what they do. They, they called it dish brain and it plays Pong. They got a little tiny brain in a dish right. to play a very simple computer game, which in itself is very interesting. That means that that little brain organoid, those little neurons could take the input of the stimuli, correlate various aspects of what needed to be output, and then try to, I don't know, play the game, move the little the little thingy what is it i don't know paddle i didn't get to sudden have yeah, a paddle. it didn't right. have hands so it didn't have hands it was just a brain it was all nerves and electricity but yeah that one i thought was a very interesting application of what we've learned so far and just kind of the basics of neural networks of the needs of neurons and the potential for networks of neurons to work together wire together fire together and engage in an activity that is external to itself it's like the, it's the basics of neurons right this is this is the basics of an organism needing to respond and work you know create multiple neuro, multiple cells that work together to respond to external stimuli in a way that is beneficial to the organism what is the thing that it needs to do what is it being programmed to do and this was it's just dish brain playing pong, but so this good. is the basic 
<laughs> it's so great. And then um, researchers also this year uh, took brain organoids and implanted them into rat brains. And it was just fine and nothing weird, <laughs> nothing weird happened. <laughs> and I think that's just the, the interesting aspect of this particular study is that we're like, oh, it's going to be some weird Frankenstein monster or something odd's going to happen. The neurons from the brain organoid aren't going to connect well or they'll connect too well and the mouse will be too smart and it's going to talk. No. <laughs> Right, right. It's if we put human cells in a mouse brain, what is that going to give the mouse in terms of abilities? But what we saw is that these neurons, this brain organoid, it wasn't just neurons, but actually other supportive cells as well that go along with the neurons. Uh, and it was a, a hybrid brain. The neurons interfaced, everything worked well. Uh, and this could be the doorway that is needed and will be used in the future to be able to test therapies for human brain disorders. Because we can't test all the therapies in humans for human brain disorders, but we have lots of mouse models, but they're not the same as mouse models. But if we can put human brain organoids within mouse brains, then this could lead to a better testing, uh, testing arena. So, but they're so small. <laughs> they're so small. But still, if we you can uh, if you can target therapies and you can uh, see if they impact behavior if negatively or beneficially, then that's going to be something that will lead you in a, a direction that could lead to a new treatment mm -hmm. or 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 away from something that will you know you don't want to waste millions of dollars in research money on. Yeah. I, I think I think it's I think that's inching towards the the best model. Of course, the best model is going to be when we have a rat that has a completely human brain. <laughs> and it says, hey, Justin, how's it going? Hey, no. like, so how's this he'll be able to write to that. Do? He doesn't have vocal cords like ours. So it's just, right. you know, he'll have to write us right. a note. <laughs> right. Press the keys. Press the keys on the keyboard. Uh -huh. Yes. No thumbs. Really. <laughs> We'll see. It could get there. But yeah, brain organoids are moving apace. They are really, I don't know, they're really getting us to a place where uh, we will be able to study a lot of the disorders of the brain without needing to slice open brains to get there. So that this is this is really good news for a lot of research that we want to do moving forward. All right. Are we ready for number six? Yeah, hit it. Number six. six. I'm not a number. I am a free man. Six. <laughs> uh, number six, ancient humans. There was a there was a tremendous amount of stuff coming from again this year from ancient humans. We got a a whole lot of ancient genomes, ten eight to ten thousand years old from South America that uh, kind of gave a picture of the populating of the of this of South America also added a couple mysteries because there was a uh, one of those hints that there was Oceania uh sort of a closely related genes to aborigines even so and that was in the, and that was on that north east uh coast of South America and nowhere else so is Big puzzling questioning things going on still about the populating of, of America, South America. We had, we got older, the current, the current modern humans. We now date back more than 30,000 years older than we were before. And I, I kind of like that story because it was a great lesson in how we do dating. Yeah. Uh, because we, we had tracked that there's this there's this layer of ash from a volcanic volcanic ash and so it came from the volcano over there right and so everything we know we figured out when that thing had erupted because it's everywhere and so we've got this idea it's less than two hundred thousand years because the the bones are are, are right there and well turned out they've now gotten to the point where they can analyze that volcanic ash and tell which 
volcano it actually came from. And it wasn't the one that was nearby. It was one much further away <laughs> that had a much bigger eruption a lot longer, 30,000 years earlier. So now they realize, okay, so that also pushes the date of everything they've dated based off of that, including some current modern humans from back in the day. And it's sort of interesting, too, because then, you know, when we start pushing that date back to more than 200,000 years, there's outlier data that no longer is outlier data elsewhere. Hmm. The outlier, you know, so we know the Denisovan cave, right? Yeah. So that's where we got the little finger bone of the first Denisovan. Well, there's also Neanderthal DNA that we've gotten from that cave. And that Neanderthal DNA had a big puzzle because it looked like there was some current modern human admixture to some of it. The problem was it dated to 200,000 years ago, before current modern humans existed, let alone left Africa. So now, but now that we have, see, then the date got pushed in the one, and now the other one that was this outlier isn't an outlier anymore. Now there's 30,000 years for that one same individual to have gone wandering up north to Siberia. Yeah, it's a Which is 30,000 years. That's a long time. Plenty of time. Plenty of time <laughs> That's plenty of time. We also had some <laughs> How do you even earliest... live that long? <laughs> we had some of the earliest cooking and fishing that was found in the, in Israel. In the site. There was, I think, the oldest the oldest current modern human remains to be found in Spain. Was, uh, was it, so everything, it's always the bigger story when it pushes back the date. We also have to remember we're also collecting all sorts of ancient human data along the way, filling in culture, diet, genomics, spread of language and humanity and art. So another, it's always a good year for ancient humans. It has been for a while. Always a good year now that we're looking back at them. I mean, for a long time, it was nothing, 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 nothing. And I feel like the, with the modern technologies that are enabling us to look more deeply at some of these sites and the the fossil remains and the, like you mentioned, the dating technologies, the, the various ways we're looking at DNA evidence, RNA, lots of stuff. Um, we're going back further with more resolution than we have before. And we're, I mean, in the last decade, we're talking about whole new arms we're talking about a tree the braided stream and all these things yeah so it's very braided stream too because we're also now talking there's tremendous amounts of homo erectus like neanderthal denisovan like a whole array of ancient humans being discovered in china and how do they fit in so even within the braided stream one of the things we have to start keeping in mind is something like homo erectus that was around for much, much longer than humans are, diversified. It's, it went, they went everywhere, and they diversified everywhere. So the, the Homo erectus type ancient humans are different in, in Western China than they are down in Indonesia, than they are down in the Levant or down in Africa or up in Europe. They're different everywhere. And so that, the whole idea of pegging humans is a one... It, that's been obliterated in just the last few years. It's so recent, and I, I, I love that we're talking about it so much. And, yeah, I'm glad you bring all these stories to the show with so much insight. Oh, my goodness. All right, well, we have talked from number 11 to number 6, and it is time for us to take a quick break. This is This Week in Science. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode, our top 11 of 2022. We are halfway through the list, and it's time for us to continue down to number one. So we will jump on back right now after I remind you that if you want to head over to twist.org and get yourself a Twist Blair's Animal Corner calendar, it is available now. You can hover twist.org. Click on the calendar links. You can purchase a calendar through Zazzle physically, or you can also purchase a PDF download that you can print yourself or take the images and put them on your computer and all that kind of fun stuff. The PDF download has some pretty fun science holidays included. You can do both. 
Also, get them both. All right. This show, we already have Patrick. This show, we're going to 11. That's right. We're going to number one. We are. We are going to start at number five right now. Five. Number five. 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 five is all about eDNA, which stands for electronic DNA. You know, you what? open up your computer and no, says, no. you got mail. You no. got DNA. No. You check it. It's an nope. electronic DNA. No? Nope. Oh, sorry. No. Nope. Nope. Um, nope. <laughs> it's environmental DNA, of course. I'm just fibbing with you. Anyway, um, there, was, there, you. <laughs> there were lots of good stories about eDNA this year. The one that I usually run over that, that we've talked about for years now is in water. Just like what kind of fish is around and you can pull out the water and you can check the DNA just floating in the water and because fish pee and shed skin and do all sorts of stuff in the water. It's just in there, right? But things went a little crazier this year. A couple of my favorite environmental DNA stories is um, that if you just take an air sample from a zoo, you can get most of the animals in the area. <laughs> it's very aerosolized. Uh, but my, my, for sure, my favorite eDNA story from this year is that most tea <laughs> contains bug DNA. Yes. Not necessarily bugs, although probably a little bit of bugs. It just there could be environmental DNA because they chomped on the on the leaf and it they left some saliva behind or they they frassed on the leaf. I'll say frass because it's less gross, right? It's, it's bug poop. Um <laughs> and then, or or just, you know, exoskeleton flakes or whatever. But so essentially researchers can take environmental DNA from tea and draw conclusions about where the tea came from, or if they know where the tea came from, what bugs are in the area, which is very cool. And also, and they, you know, you I could guess probably gross, but, you yeah. could probably also have information about how insecticides are working in certain areas yes. and how that's impacting the the crop and you know what's going on. There's a lot that can be done and with where, eDNA. Where tea is being grown, it's also being it's being dried typically outdoors you know it's yeah so before you drink any tea you should really boil it in water to sanitize it oh wait a second justice <laughs> that's what we do anyway um also i i don't know if this counts as edna but i threw it in here anyway there was a whole study about using leeches to understand the biodiversity that the that the leech came from because they draw blood from a bunch of different animals. And so they can actually pull DNA from the blood, from the guts of the leech to figure out uh, what animals are in the area. So I, you know, you could consider yeah, that environmental I like DNA, it. I think, because it's not in the, you're not testing the animal. You are testing the, the stomach of another animal that didn't <laughs> actually eat that animal completely. So it's just kind of like, what's the cocktail they got rolling around in the leech tummy. And I know Justin, you were excited to talk about this too. Did you have any to add? Just that, just that we've conservatively, at least I think, gone back now two million years. Yeah. Collected DNA. Last time, last record was one million years. It was from a mammoth bone found in Siberia, found in permafrost, I assume. And we've managed to extract some DNA from that ancient beast and reconstructed a bit. Now with environmental DNA, we've at least doubled that. <clears throat> and we didn't get one thing. We got a mastodon. We got crabs. We got reindeer. We got we got hundreds and hundreds of plants. We have an entire biome that we managed to rebuild. And this was from an ice core or what? So it's from a soil core. Soil core. Uh, so it. there's a fjord up there in the north part of, of Greenland. That uh, had gotten, you know, the tide goes in out, drops down sediment, and it did that over over a couple million years. And then the ice came down on, you know, got covered in ice, and then it was stuck under the, that frost. So it was super cold, uh, no oxygen. But the real thing, the thing they think that actually managed to keep this DNA preserved is the amount of quartz in the soil. So quartz <laughs> has a charge, DNA has a charge, and by the DNA bonding to the surface of the quartz, it preserved it chemically. So it didn't break down like it normally would. Uh, 
and so in in the the story's kind of fun because they've had this they've had this soil core for i think a decade or, or two, almost two decades and every time they had a new technique they would try it out in the core and get nothing and then you know time would go by and they've got some new techniques and they test it out on this core and get nothing and then you know and it went on i think four five six times and then finally with the latest round of innovation and 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 really brainy thing and they managed to do the extraction and so there's now this wonderful glimpse the furthest back glimpse we've really gotten into animals and plants and really i think also the amazing part of this story isn't actually the the collection of it in the one of the more hostile environments on the earth it's it's and it's not even the information that they ended up with as amazing as that is it's the fact that they were able to reconstruct so many genomes starting with mere fragments and that's that's one of those you know go into the power of machine learning or, or algorithms being able to assist uh, that is not something you can do by hand it would it took people de uh, 10 you know a decade and a billion dollars to piece together the human genome that way yeah i was just but, thinking about that sitting in in high school biology and watching this uh video about how they're so close they're almost done they've been at it so long yeah <laughs> like, I think that news came out again this year, which they were like, oh, we really finally finished it this year. <laughs> Good for Really you, got a little bit more accurate. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it, the the truth is you can do that with pretty, pretty darn good accuracy in 48 hours, an entire human genome. Uh, yeah. With I think with the Oxford uh, nanopore, it might even be quicker than 48 hours. But it's it's sequencing a gene itself is no longer the biggest obstacle. Right. But in this scenario, when all you have are little tiny chipped, uh, cut up fragments from across a whole biome that have all de you know, uh, donated something to this mix, yeah, to be able to take that and reconstruct just That's goes to show all of the all. Of the That's why we went and sequence the genome of a of a of a crab or of a, of a reindeer or of all these other creatures that we may not plan on ex doing a whole lot of experimentation on but now we can see when it belongs to that family and when it doesn't when it belongs to something else when it belongs to a particular type of plant little bits yeah. of that code when they match up and ne to nothing else then we know we've we've got something that that's a match there but that 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 whole that whole process was just really fascinating to me Ancient eDNA, new eDNA, current air DNA, blood DNA, T DNA, and ancient. Now let's move on to number four. 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 The cause of MS? Do we know? Yes. We? Well. Yes, it was reported this year that uh, scientists have linked the Epstein-Barr virus with causing multiple sclerosis. Now, this isn't an absolute 100% knock-it-out-of-the-park finding, and of course, this is science, so there are many individuals who debate this, and of course, this autoimmune disease, multiple sclerosis, may have other causes related to different viruses, but in this particular study, uh, researchers, after a two-decade study, found that uh, Epstein-Barr viral infection is the leading cause the leading cause not just correlated necessarily but actually causing the virus we know epstein-barr virus causes mononucleosis if somebody uh can avoid it until adolescence or adulthood you're more likely to get the mononucleosis a lot of kids get it um and some people are genetically predisposed to have certain reactions and it depends on environment, depends on all sorts of stuff that are going on. But, it, it, but they sort of, we've been informed of that like through this latest pandemic. I think everybody's aware. Everything, we, can all, we can all get the same virus. 
and have different and, outcomes. And have very different uh, reactions and outcomes. Yeah, but it's very fascinating. It's like, uh, you know, being able to years ago, be able to start vaccinating for HPV and the, the, and suddenly have a reduction in a number of different cancers, not just one cancer, but a number of different cancers, not just in women, but also in men, um, you know, things that we didn't know were linked, but that were virally being caused as it be, because of interactions between viruses and our immune system, viruses and bacteria and our immune system. Um, we are learning so much. And, and like you're mentioning, Justin, COVID-19 has been in the background of everything this year, the foreground for many of us still. Um, it is the ongoing pandemic that has never ended, but it has also allowed us to dig even deeper into viruses as the causes of disease. Looking at Looking at SARS-CoV-2 as a cause of um, long COVID, for instance, you know, we're looking at uh, at all sorts of things in a different light. Chronic, uh, uh, what is it? Chronic uh, when you're tired. Fatigue. <laughs> fatigue. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Chronic fatigue syndrome and many others, which had been linked yeah. to, you know, but people have been fighting really, really working really hard to say it's there are viruses involved and we don't know exactly how and there's something happening here. You know, now there's a little bit more going on. So I think that it, it's not just that we're seeing this year, this particular study that really targeted Epstein-Barr and found it to be incredibly highly linked to the cause of, my, of mul multiple sclerosis. It's that we're looking at viruses across the board in a new way. And if we continue to do that, it's going to benefit us all as a society. Moving on to number three. Ooh, three, 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 three. Is all about one of my favorite things to talk about, regenerative <laughs> medicine. Oh, is it so, now? <laughs> yes, because we have found all sorts of ways that I may work to live forever this year. That's right. That's right. Some of them won't affect me directly, like the ability to make synthetic embryos, <laughs> although that was mind-boggling. Um, basically make a an embryo with a beating heart without an egg or a sperm. So that happened. Uh, also, a dead pig <laughs> was made, basically its cells, or sorry, its organs were kind of reinvigorated after it was dead. <laughs> So then there's this whole question about what is dead and also, you know, yikes. But well, this is also why we have to give the... <laughs> what is death the, anyway? The organoids. Is, yes. Is a, is a bob, and then you give the pig a human brain. Then you kill it and bring it back so you can talk to it after and it can tell you, what, you it, what the other side is like. Perfect. Yeah. So um, essentially, <laughs> this is not the horror story it sounds like, but it does mean that uh, there are lots of ways to keep organs healthy longer, which is really what this is about. Um, speaking yeah. of that, there was a human that received a pig heart transplant uh, that went better than expected. They did not survive the year, but they survived longer than their outlook was prior to the transplant. So it was a net gain of time and it, it went better than anticipated, but um, still a lot to do there. And then also we had lots of animals regrowing things, uh, so axolotls, many. as always, kind of the 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 poster child for regeneration. Um, they regrow parts of their brains after injuries. There were studies looking at how we can kind of harness that ourselves. Um, and then also there's a study the where hydra, the hydra can can regenerate its whole head. Right. I mean, yes. They yes. can take the head off and they'll just, re ah, I'll just make a new one. Yeah. Yeah. Too bad they're not real. Anyway. <laughs> um... No, no, no. No, no. no. <laughs> they're, 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 there's something that is real. It's called a hydra. It's called a hydra, but it's but it's related to like jellyfish. It's not. Yes. It's yeah. It's yeah. Not a head. It does have a head. It has a head. Anyway, um, and then also, uh, <laughs> don't try to animal corner the animal corner. All right, 
Anyway, uh, yeah. uh, also there's a study about frog legs where um, they were able to stimulate regrowth of some amputated legs on a frog, which is so cool. Um, yeah, it's, it sounds like there's lots of good stuff on the way. We'll be able to keep organs alive longer. We we're further on the path to regenerating limbs and brain cells. Brain cells are really the thing, man. Like, <sighs> obviously, it would yes. be great to be able to regrow a finger or an arm or a leg. But regrowing brain cells, that's the top of the list. Because <laughs> that's like, you know, brain deterioration as you age. Wouldn't it be great if you could just regrow parts of your brain? Yeah, yeah. you know what? And it could be a good therapy because I think there's people out there who want to get rid of memories yeah you yeah eternal sunshine style i get it well yeah. I, don't, I don't i don't necessarily mean it like that uh but ptsd and you know really it's, i guess that's an amygdala uh frontal cortex connection issue too but yeah you know like if, if somebody was like hey you know your, your brain's starting to deteriorate there justin if we get rid of a bunch of your memories we can put in some new brains and regenerate it and you'll you have a very well functioning brain but you'll have to lose a bunch of your memories that would be tough do you want to be a new a, person do you want heart, to potentially yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah just grow more on top just a little more on the top for me <laughs> it depends, yeah it, it would very much depend on where that it's you know you have to learn to rewalk or retalk that might be something i'd be willing to take on more so than not remembering I just want my brainchild from the tick. That's all I want. <laughs> That's right. Just chair face. Carve your name into the moon. There's so many cool things going. Regenerative synthetic biology, re regenerative stuff is so neat. Just being able to take things that are getting older and regenerate them. Can we sometime, someday have new limbs? Can we fix our brains? Can we get rid of the uh, organ transplantation problems that we have? Can we actually have organs for people? Like, can what can we, we do if people get close called, to death? Um, can we help them? Myelin sheets. Can we myelin regrow sheets? that? Can we yes. regrow bone when there's yes. osteoporosis going on? This would all be amazing. Ooh, yes. Ugh. Can't We're wait. We're getting there. We're getting there. So many good things. Do you want my 300th birthday? On Twist episode <laughs> 10,000. <laughs> Can't wait to hear the stories that we've got then. <laughs> Moving to number two. Two, 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 two. Wow, we're already at number two. This was a big year for curing cancer and HIV. Seriously. Uh, there was, was kind of earlier on in the year, there was a, a woman who was completely cured of HIV with an umbilical cord treatment, a stem cell type uh, therapy. And, you know, when, when we hear about these things, you gotta say, oh gosh, well, maybe, maybe there's, well, and then there was another uh, story about four, uh, the fourth person who was uh, cured of HIV with a different technique. We had, we had a couple of different cancer treatments, one in mice, one in rats. One was a, a an embedded drug system that was working basically on its uh, on its own and take, taking down tumors we had a sound therapy one where they could actually go in with this high power concentrated and disrupt and break up tumors without doing surgery without cutting into the animal at all uh, and then uh, of course we've had a, a number of different the, there was one not a couple of weeks ago where they had this drug combination that was putting uh, leukemia patients into undetectable remission. Uh, they couldn't right. detect the disease in like 85% of the patients. And that kind of thing is amazing because that's in people. That's not mice. It's not rats, even though the mouse and rat stuff is like getting us forward. But mm -hmm. this is like the first year that I think we've had multiple findings of remission or no cancer found in humans mm -hmm. with different studies yeah there's there's it's we had some success early on with the car t therapies yeah those were, yeah those were making it disappear and almost giving an immunity to certain types of cancer 
but they yeah. were, but they, and they're very expensive, but they were also initially had this couple of percent chance of going completely haywire and killing the patient. So you want a cure that doesn't have a chance of killing you. That's always preferable. And that seems to be what we're getting. You know, HIV, putting HIV into complete remission, putting cancers into complete remission. And there, there's another one in here that I don't remember the, this one. This was uh, uh, the, the colon cancer. I don't remember that one. But that yeah, rectal here. cancer. Yeah, yeah. Four, four patients all uh, went into remission wow. from immunotherapy treatment. Yeah, so four for four. It's a small sample size, but still, again, in yeah, humans. You take it. Especially if you're one of those four. Yes. If you're one of those four or someone who knows one of those four, you there are you thrilled. So yeah. So we we and these are these are phase you know, once you're in the human trials like these HIV and a couple of these cancer yeah. ones we've talked about, we're in two, heading into three, maybe at three, heading into a treatment that you can get from your doctor. You're getting you're getting this research to that point now where there's going to be certain cancers that we take off of the the the, the table for death that we take you know, off of. You get this, you won't have to live with it, and it's not going to be the thing that kills you. And that's and, huge. And so it's 2022. Yeah. We started doing this show back a long time ago. KDBS 90.3 FM, Davis. College radio, it's 22 years ago that we started, really. Maybe a little bit more than that, but I'm not counting. Who's counting? Um, <laughs> 22 is enough. 22 is enough. But so many, so many shows we reported on possibilities for potential cures for cancer. We reported on um, gold nano dots, gold nano particles that were being used to be embedded into tumors that could then be used for uh, ultrasound to heat tumors from inside using sound to vibrate the, the gold particles. You know, it was 20 years ago, and that was like early research into this stuff. And now we're seeing very specific ultrasound being used, hyper-focused ultrasound being used to disrupt tumors. Uh, we are seeing humans having what um, I'm, I'm now seeing is called NED, no evidence of disease. We've got to keep up. It's not remission anymore. It's no evidence of disease. Thank right. you, Shubru. Um, we are seeing this in humans, in people, based on research that's been gone ongoing for two decades. And, you know, in the early 2000s, it was, oh yeah, cure for cancer. Every interview we had, yeah. five or 10 years. Five or 10 years, we'll have a cure for cancer. Nobody was really talking about the, oh, well, what is cancer? Yeah. It's a bunch of different diseases. Which cancer? Cool. Which cancer? Yeah. What are you it's talking about? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, cured in which stage and all this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think that our conversations have become more nuanced. I think that the way we're looking at it as uh, as people is a lot more nuanced. You know, this is, the scientists working on it, obviously, were in deep in their particular niche of what they were studying. But I think that what we've seen over the last, last two decades, like, I don't know. This is amazing. This year was great. Cancer, HIV. I mean, we grew up during the HIV uh, pandemic and this is, I'm, I'm so excited about all this and where it's going. No cures yet. Well, we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. I mean, I so think we have cures. Right? We're like There's crazy. options. We're like yeah. on the brink of so many things. It's amazing. Yes. Okay. But I'm it, excited. And, and this is one of those things, too. Like, this is the last word on that. Uh, there's 30 million people who actively have HIV uh, currently on the planet. So it's yeah. 30 million people who need this research to keep going. Yep. And there's like three who have been cured so far. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, five. Five. Okay. Oh. <laughs> hey, just, you know. Get the numbers right. People in there For and those two family. people and the people that know those two people, it's a big it's a difference. Big You're right. You're right. Are we ready for number one? Is it time? Let's hear number one. Number one. 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 
one, 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 one. Did everyone guess? Number one. Did everyone guess what this was going to be? Do you this know what this no is? Brainer. This was the one. This is one year where we didn't even argue about it. No. <laughs> Not no. at all. And we have debated on previous years, like what's going to go where and which one can be and who, who's it, what's it, which it, uh, it's NASA. NASA takes home the number one spot this year. NASA, James Webb Space Telescope. Mm -hmm. We've been waiting for that one for oh, over 15 years. Mm -hmm. That one is such a long time in the coming. And, you know, over the last year or so debates about its name put to the side you know let's just talk about the science mm -hmm. let's talk about the fact that this multi-billion dollar space telescope the successor and uh cohabitor of space with hubble at this point in time um it unfurled. It did all the things it was supposed it to do. It had so many ways it was going to go wrong. Web won. Web won the year. Web started bringing us new images of things in Beautiful. ways that we just didn't expect. And oh, it also brought, of course, new controversies within the world of astrophysics and cosmology. And what does this mean? And what does that mean? And what does its data mean? And can we look deeper? So there is so much more that's going to be coming. Webb was amazing. We also actually returned to the moon, kind of. We got Artemis launched, which I was convinced it wasn't going to happen. Artemis launched. The, winter, the, the Orion mission went around the moon. And it came back safely. Okay. Everything was so, good. Yeah, the only problem well, with that story is, it. yeah, it, it's like sort of getting really excited about walking to the corner store when for the last decade we've been launching all kinds of things to Mars, <laughs> much oh, further yeah. away. You know, we're landing, we got robots running around on Mars and we're like, hey, we just we just walked to the corner of the moon over there and back. Not as exciting. It doesn't hold. It, it didn't get me. I'm like kind of surprised <laughs> that it was even such a big story. I mean, I get it. This is this is well, for future human exploration, and it's the yeah, test exactly. Run. We that. the That's next important. the next. This is the first step. It's like the phase one, phase two trial, right? You get you get the thing launched. You show that it works, and then you go, okay, now we can put people on it. And then we're going to take people to the moon and we'll land on the moon. We'll have a new rover on the moon. We'll start doing science on the moon. Oh, maybe we'll build a, uh, maybe we will have a place where we will let people live on the moon. Maybe we will have a spaceport on the moon. Maybe we will use it as a launch pad to the rest of the solar system. Like this is the beginning of, uh, of our next steps back It'll out into space resource. as people. It'll be a billionaire's <laughs> resort planet. Probably. I'm not, I don't want to talk about that right now. And anyway. then it'll affect the tides because we're going to put too much mass on the moon. <laughs> no, it's not. We take enough off, off the earth already. Every we are, We're losing water. We're doing it's all sorts of issues going on. Okay, anyway. <sighs> <laughs> the big thing beyond that at the end of the year that NASA knocked out of the park. I mean, it's seriously like 18 holes of golf in the solar system. And then it's like, Boo, we're going to do a hole in one. And the golf ball is not just going to do a hole in one, but it's also going to shoot down to the core of the earth and spew out the other side. And you know, oh, anyway, dart the dart mission to push an asteroid. We did it. We sh we shoved Dimorphos, Dimorphos. We shoved shoved a little moonlet of a an asteroid, and in our shoving, we shoved it so hard that we could see just how much we pushed. There was a multi thousand kilometer tail off of Dimorphos after the event, um, and the idea is very very positive for our op our opportunities in the future of being able to push threatening asteroids yeah you know to act a little like i could i could protect myself we could do Isn't something this the here year the movie don't look up came out 
I this do believe in year. Him. No, this is I know NASA plans yeah. things ways way in advance, but it does feel like very interesting timing. <laughs> that movie came out, we were all like, oh no. <laughs> oh, don't worry about it. We got a dart. Oh no, we're working on this. We're yeah. actually working on it. Perfect, perfect timing. Yeah. So it was just a little moonlit, but uh it's a little moonlit with mass and uh what we will learn from what our show did. Uh, to its trajectory around Didymus, it, its asteroid, uh, and you know what its how its orbit changes, and there's a lot of data still to be reported on, um, but it's looking very promising. I think it was I, really, really a great, great effort. And I shouldn't be do- talking about this on the show like this because uh, uh, I'm may- I, there's a very good chance I'm just misremembering this or misheard this, but I think that tail that we're seeing from it. We must have hit that hard or something or things get just break up in space because I heard there was like millions of tons of debris yeah. that got sh- sh- shoved off of it, schlepped off of it, that came off of tons. The- yeah, that was the massive tail. Yeah. Tons yeah. of debris. Yeah. We hit it hard. <laughs> yeah. We didn't, that wasn't just a little soft nudge. Like, you know, no, it was a sh- comes up, lands, and then a little... Get out of my solar system. It. No, we, we it was ramming speed right there. We slammed yeah. into that thing. Ramming speed. Oh, humans. We really know how to throw our weight around in this little solar system of ours. Yeah. It is. Can we fix it with a explosion? Is my question. <laughs> well, we can fix it with a rocket. Yes, a little shove. Yeah. So James Webb, Dart, uh, all the work on Mars, all of the effort with Artemis and the Orion mission. NASA has really been knocking it out of the park again with some amazing, amazing. Uh, efforts, discoveries. And this is, I think, the exciting thing and why it's really number one is it's that what NASA is doing is the place where science and engineering meet, where you have the best engineering making the best science possible. And because Webb is where it is, we are going to be learning so much more about our universe. Because DART was so successful, we are going to be potentially more protected in the future because Artemis was successful. Maybe humans will be back on the moon sooner rather than later. So I see a lot of hope here. (laughs) With that, with that James Webb too, the thing that I guess I, I, I didn't realize was going to be so impactful was its ability to look at exoplanets. Or to yeah. look at really distant planets and get information out. I, mean, I, I knew that it was going to get some deep uh, looks, some galactic looks, uh, that it might be finding ex- exoplanets. But being able, the t- kind of data it's getting from exoplanets is telling us about atmospheres on them. I mean, that's just, that's a completely new level of detail that we're getting for what other, whatever. And it's going to look like, and then, of course, it means that's an accelerated search for life. Are we alone? Are we not? No way. More water worlds. Yeah, we're we're going to be able to. And Blair, like you said, we, a story that we did not cover on this top 11 countdown, one that was your favorite was the panspermia evidence, where now we have shown that RNA and DNA are spontaneously formed on meteorites. That's and right. Found them all over the place. Found oh, RNA and DNA all over the place. Um, and so it's stuff like Webb and the way Webb looks at signatures, chemical signatures in uh, atmospheres and around stars will be able to see these signatures much more easily. So I think, is it, isn't it just RNA? I don't think it's DNA. Oh, and DNA. I, it was both, yeah. Both. Both. RNA and DNA. Yeah. So are we sending it out there? Is it coming from out out there to us? Is that where we came from? Can't wait to find out. I'm so excited. Must watch twists next well, year. I think actually the more exciting thing is that, yeah, there's those chemical components, meaning physics being the same everywhere in the universe, standard model applying everywhere in the universe. Is and and chemistry. Learning. 
yeah the chemistry it's is not applying, going chemistry it's applying if it all applies then it's everywhere you know, then it yeah, can be everywhere. any planet that has the right conditions or a range of conditions that could could work will work and probably have because it happens so our one example that we've studied up close is this planet and it happens so quickly after the forming of this planet mm -hmm. so that we are quickly. either the exception or the rule or the rule and if we're the rule there's a lot of us out there and if we're yeah. the exception there's still a lot of us just because yeah, there's, there's a lot of planets there's a lot of planets plenty of so exceptions so th speaking of things that are going to be interesting moving forward, okay, we've finished number one. We're going to be moving into some other fun science stories that we want to talk about just beyond this. But uh, we've basically finished our countdown here. But in big physics kind of stuff, uh, we are going to be looking at um, LIGO and its co-telescope uh, constituents around the world. Uh, they're going to be not just looking at black holes, but because... You know, black holes, when they uh, merge, they create a rippling in the fabric of space-time. Uh, LIGO is going to be used to test the hypothesis that if there are other life forms out there with greater technologies that are potentially using big warp drives and things like that to move through space, then if they're there, here's the hypothesis, right? If they are there, then they would likely be causing a signature on space time. And Catch so they're their warp going signature. Star Trek is real. Yes, they're looking for warp signature. So instead of triangulating on the ringing of a bell in one particular place in in space time, they will be looking to see if there are moving signatures across space time, which would be indicative of something like a warp drive or other very large influence on space time. <laughs> I can't wait. This you is know, amazing. We're using our technology to be investigating these so sci fi things. I mean, okay, that's we're looking into the future now. But anyway, I, I, I know. I, okay, never mind. But this is This Week in Science, and we finished our top 11 countdown, and we are thank you. We are we are thank you. We are thankful that you have joined us for this show so far. Remember, if you head to twist.org, you can support us on Patreon. You can also click on the Blair's Animal Corner calendar links, and you can buy a physical calendar, or you can buy a uh, print-it-yourself PDF calendar. Beautiful, beautiful Lego animals and backgrounds and such great stuff. Head over to twist.org, get yourself a calendar for 2023 and support Twist. You can also support us on Patreon. We appreciate all of your support because we are listener supported. So thank you for all of your support. We can't do it without you. We're going to come back because you always want to know about those other stories, right? What are some of the stories from the last year that we were like, oh, I love that story, but it's not quite on the list. What was 13? What was 14? What was whatever? Blair, tell us what yeah. were your favorites, your MVPs from 2023 in the Animal Corner. Oh, well, my MVP in general for the Animal Corner this year is spiders. Now, I know we talk about spiders a lot. And how much you don't the like show, them, but you like in them. In general. I both do not like them in my personal space, particularly near my face, but I also love them from afar and love spider science. It's a very strange relationship I have in my brain. Anyway, they did so many things this year. We found out that spiders sleep and they'll nap and they'll snooze. We found out that spiders catapult away from the males will catapult away from females to avoid getting eaten, which was amazing. We found out that they can hear sounds just in the open air through their webs. Their webs will resonate to uh, to be able to read them almost like guitar strings. We found out they can curl leaves to form their own little homes or hats. So it's kind of like tool use. And the one that uh, is particularly terrifying is that um, they we've talked about 
spiders hunting in groups before as like, oh, did you know some spiders hunt in groups? Turns out a lot of spiders hunt in groups enough that there are different strategies in the spider canon <laughs> of how to yeah. hunt in groups and that they they all kind of have these different strategies depending on where they live and the type of things that they eat and all these kinds of things so spiders all over the place there were even more there was one about um taking making a, an artificially created spider silk that could be used as a nerve sheath for healing nerves and in what? your body there there was another one about spiders dancing and how the quality of their dancing impacts the their mating success, but also their kind of energy level impacts their dance. It was a whole crazy thing. Anyway, search spider on twist.org, browse through these. It's all amazing. Um, the newly trending topic in Blair's Animal Corner that started this year? Yes. Clitorises. We started and ended the year talking about them. We, uh, I did. <laughs> in January, we found out that dolphins have clitorises and that it seems like there there is an element of sexual pleasure for female dolphins. Go fig. Then we had the basically the exact same story for snakes in December. Just was that last week? It so was like last week. Yeah. So I think, ago. you know, and in both of them, I kind of lamented how this isn't studied male pleasure in copulation is studied because it's all about spreading the seed. And this is the whole kind of narrative. Right. And then, so, so the female side of things hasn't really been looked at, but then like, why did these structures exist and why would they only exist in humans and not in anyone else? And so the fact that they were found in two completely different groups of animals, mammals and reptiles, and the fact that uh, both of them showed similar, um, kind of indication of potential for sexual pleasure and that there would be an evolutionary benefit to that there you're going to see more of this and i will report on it when it happens i guarantee you blair are you are you, are you saying that we will see more clitorises yes we <laughs> will twist okay. yeah yeah Good. we certainly Good can and uh for those high school teachers out there that is play this? our show this is biology this is real science it I'm using real the science. scientific words. This is important to learn. It is. Yeah, no, because my, my first question is, is this convergent? Or is this... Right. And it seems like Are we a copulatory dinosaurs? organ, a copulatory organ, we do not think is convergent. We think that has an evolutionary uh, ancestor that, that kind of way in common, way back there. And if also recognizing clitoris is... Um, is in terms of embryonic development the same structure as a penis yes. means it is likely to have the same origin so yeah. this is kind of one of those things that's like yeah that would certainly make sense but nobody studied it because for some reason female pleasure and sex is taboo and it's not talked about and it's like is it even there even in humans and so it's you know it's a whole i can't wait for this to open up a little more um and and I want to learn all about it. Has it been? It hasn't been in doubt if it was there in humans. Uh, I mean, not by scientists. <laughs> I think you're. Yeah. I, well, but I it's think you're talking about uh, something in the. Uh, it's just, I don't even know if it's taboo to talk about the G spot. That's where I think that's the one that people are always like, "Is that a real thing or not?" It's, right. No, it's bo it's both. A, it's both. It's both. No, but it's, it's both. Definitely yeah. Definitely structure. That's but this all stems from a lack of study into female anatomy, into like even the female psyche and various yeah. as aspects of of female reproduction, because yes. of who the scientists are, who's been allowed to play, and the questions that have been asked. So this Absolutely, is... Absolutely, yeah. And it's, it's, it's all, it's you know, if, if I may say the flamboyant thing, it's based in misogyny, people. It's based in this idea that, like, <laughs> women are vessels to, to grow humans, and that's the deal, right? And so, like, you need to divest that from the situation and recognize that there there's the potential for evolutionary benefits to pleasure on both sides it's not just a vessel the egg is also selfish and needs to be tended to so Ooh, it, those are bold words there blair 
the egg is selfish. Yeah, what? it is. It's a lot the of a egg. lot of resources. The animals with eggs are born with all the eggs. <laughs> That's it. You got your eggs. It has got to be selfish. Anyway. So clitorises, you'll hear more that, about that hopefully in 2023. Fingers, <laughs> fingers, toes, and legs crossed. Anyway, um, and the last thing I wanted to mention was unhinged robots. This was a very strange year for weird use of robotics. And uh, I'm using robotics very loosely, so don't yell at me in the chat room. But I am including uh, one thing in this kind of conversation, which is... Um, Necrobotics, <laughs> which that was is the such use a good story of dead spiders and injecting them with air to open up their legs and then use them to slowly, gently close and pick things up that are very fragile. Will we need to use this? Doubtful. However, <laughs> proof of concept maintained. Um, also, there was a robotic tentacle made that looks like spaghetti that you can pick up again fragile things with or things that are weirdly shaped it's bizarre but the tentacle robots um oh yeah kiki showing the neck robotics right now of the spiders they were able to put air in, inject air to mess with the hydraulics of the legs they could pick stuff up <laughs> just truly deranged um, <laughs> i really want that, that in is, like that, that next totally kid grabber toy <sighs> at the <laughs> the local arcade. Do you need the dead spider for that, or can you recreate the hydraulics that are spider legs? I think you Who can. Knows? Who knows? It's anyway. Yeah, but it's funner to use a spider. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah. So then there was the the crazy spaghetti tentacles yes. that were robots, also for picking things up. Lots of yeah. pressure on picking things up this year. And then the last thing, the thing Justin actually wanted to be the number one story of the year. This is the um, only yeah. thing I would have put ahead of NASA. Because I think, <laughs> I think it is, you know, when, when NASA is like, we went around the moon, but we're going to put a man on the moon next time around. This is a version of going on the moon. This is a feat as big as landing and of a man course, on the moon. Justin is talking about the goldfish that could drive a car. Yeah. So not a not a normal car. It was a tank with wheels. And so they they taught this goldfish how to with the air where they swam in the tank to steer this <laughs> little tank on wheels, this little goldfish car, this auto. This fish tank. is driving fish the tank. There's nobody with a <laughs> yeah. remote control. Yeah, he's fish driving it. Is steering this? Yeah, forget the moon rover. You got this fish rover now. This to me yeah. is the biggest. Really, is the biggest story of the year. And and Fada's yes. saying he thinks it's uh, <laughs> Ig Nobel Prize worthy, and I would say it's not because it's actually a, a more serious thing. It's a proof of concept that is that is it's silly on the surface, but I think is really cool in a lot of layers. So you're proving that a goldfish can figure this out, first of all. Second of all, that it can indicate preference of where it wants to go and adjust. But then third of all, that that they were able to invent this thing that could interface with a fish. <laughs> Just... So yeah, it is possible to make technology so user-friendly <laughs> literally a fish could use it. Yeah. <laughs> so no excuses for your complicated user interface. And I love that it can compare and do all these things. No, you don't need to do any of that. If the fish can drive a car, then <laughs> so all the rest you. of this. Yeah. <laughs> the self driving car should be here some, yesterday. <laughs> well, maybe it was. Well, it, it, the self driving fish car would be uh, a remote control that the humans were driving. So that's not quite right. You want, like, yeah, you I don't know if you've be, seen yeah. Star Trek Discovery, but they have these, like, these particles that you just kind of move your hands around and it steers the spaceship. That's really what you're talking about. Cause that's what the goldfish is doing. You're just like, I want to go that way. Yeah. Basically. It goes yeah. that way. Yeah. Anyway. So yeah, the, that, the that's fish my, bot that car. Is my favorite story here. Yeah. It's, it's a breakthrough. I think it's, well, it's uh it like seems silly on the surface, but it's scientifically, it's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Who else can we put into little vehicles and just, Send them places. Fish yeah. bots. Oh, good gracious. I think we've done it. 
Do we have anything else that we want to add to the uh, list was, of 2022? We did not include it's, COVID. It's, 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 <laughs> we it's didn't include, COVID. everybody had it. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, everyone I, had I it. Uh, it's over apparently, but then there's still places in the red tier right now. So it's clearly not over. <laughs> but um, But vaccines happened. Boosters happened. Not really, you know. We we figured out it wasn't engineered in a lab. All good stuff. We realized we should wear masks, but then yeah. we didn't make people. So that's great. Justin, what were you going to add on? No, no, I was just, uh, it's, it's a nothing comment. I was just going to say that the, the fish car. Yes. Shows, shows, you know, because you always get like, who got credit for landing on the moon? A uh, bunch of pilots. Well, this this fish car shows you how big of a difference you can have between pilot intelligence and the engineers that made the craft. There can That's be, true. Can be a little bit of gap. <laughs> don't don't down talk fish intelligence now. I mean, not, 2022 was another year of animal cognition and animal intelligence in which we saw all year. sorts of cool things. We didn't talk about bees playing, which I'm I still love debating in my so own much. mind. I loved it. Corvids yeah. and their and uh, different J species and their intelligence, apes. And there was a, there was so much. Lots of, lots of animals communicating through sound that we didn't know about before. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just because we couldn't hear it, because our hearing is not good. The world <laughs> is becoming apparent to us yes, as we I ask the it. right questions. Yeah. But I do think that we have gotten to the end of our show. Oh, yeah, Paul Disney, the next step is to get some slime mold to pilot a spaceship to the moon. Mm. That, there we go. There, that's the well, next we step. got the watch. We got the slime mold watch. So we're on our yeah. way. You do have the slime mold watch. You're right. <laughs> slime yeah. mold that tells time. Okay, everyone. We did it. We've counted down all the top stories of 2022, according to us and our review of the year. And yes, Patrick Pecoraro, no, we are not very choosy and specific. We like to be broad and graspy <laughs> because, you know, that's what life is. There's so many big picture things going on, in the, and that's where our future is as well. If you have issues with it, take it up with us on Mastodon, because we don't know where it is. <laughs> That's right. Go find Twist it, Science on Mastodon. There you go. We had, we, it, they always end up being these little categories now, because there's, we do over 600 stories a year now. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, so many stories. Yeah. that you, you run with these themes that it's like, okay, well, there was, yeah, my, like microbiome was a, you know, a dozen studies. That really caught our eye at some point during the year. So they can't, that's how come that's a category and not, you know, something else, I guess. Yeah. And like I said at the beginning of the show, like there are, you can't very often, very, very rarely is it a single study that changes the direction of no, science. No. Well, um, and we don't want to just re-report a single story. We already did that. We'd rather yeah. give you the liner notes on like 50 to go look at later. Go so you're welcome. You're welcome. We reviewed your year for you. All this happened and more. Oof. Thank you for being here through 2022 with us. It has been quite a year. Another amazing yeah. year. And I feel so lucky to have shared it with all of you. Um, you know, every week, no matter how down I am or whatever, whenever I have the chance to come here and talk about science, it m reminds me of all the thoughtful, compassionate, incredible people that are out there in the world that are doing work to feed our curiosity and to help us understand this little blue rock where we live. So it's all about being with you all every week, except for next week, because we're going to be taking a break. Anyway, shout outs to 
I'd love to th say thank you to Fada for all your help on show notes and on the social medias. Thank you for helping with all that. Gord, Arnlor, thank you for helping to keep our chat rooms nice places to hang out. Identity4, thank you for recording the show. And Rachel, thank you for editing the show. And as always, of course, I must thank above and beyond our Patreon sponsors. Thank you to Teresa Smith, James Schaefer, Richard Badge, Kent Northcote, Rick Loveman, Pierre Velazar, John Ratnaswamy, Carl Kornfeld, Karen Tazi, Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Bigard Chefstad, Hal Snyder, Jonathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, Ali Coffin, Gaurav Sharma, Regan, Derek Schmidt, Don Mundus, Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fred S104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, Jack, Brian Carrington, David E. Youngblood, Gru and Bob. John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessenplow, Steve Leesman, a.k.a. Zima, Ken Hayes, Christopher Rappin, Dana Pearson, Richard, Brendan Minish, John, blah, 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 Johnny Gridley, Remy Day, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Rick Ramis, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, E.O., Adam Mishkan, Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBell, Bob Carlder, Marjorie, Paul Disney, David Simmerly, Patrick Pecoraro, Tony Steele, and Jason Roberts. Thank you all for all of your support on Patreon. Thank you, everyone, for your support on Patreon. We really can't do this without you. So if you watching the show right now feel like you would love to support the show, head over to twist.org and click on the Patreon link and help us uh, keep the show going throughout 2023 and into the further future. Help us get to 1,000 episodes. Let's do it. We hit 900 this year. Let's go up to 1,000. And, oh, yeah, on next week's show, Justin. Well, on next week's show, we don't have a show. But no. the show after that. <laughs> the week after that, we'll be, uh, we'll be back, both uh, two shows, one Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time, and another one at 5 a.m. Central European time. It's uh, the same show. You can, it's, you can join us on uh, YouTube. <laughs> we got Facebook. And we also are always here at twist.org slash live. Oh, also, that'll be our um, prediction show. When we yeah. come back. Yes. 2023, the first week of January. Mm -hmm. Join us as we predict the future of science. Looking forward into 2023 and also looking backwards to see how we did about predicting 2022. I looked and I, I didn't do well. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Do you want to listen to us as a podcast? Maybe listen to some old episodes about some of the things we talked about today while you're take while we take the week off next week. Just search for this week in science if our podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe as well. For any uh, information on the stories that you heard here today, to, to go and read the papers yourself, even the links to the stories are available on our website www.twist.org where you can also sign up for something called a newsletter. Yeah. You can also contact us directly, email kiki at kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or me, Blair, at blairbaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, in the subject line, or your email will be spam filtered into a previous year, and we'll never find it again. Well, you Hi, can hey. also hit us up on the Mastodon. Is it a mastodon or a mammoth? What is it called? Mastodon. It is a mastodon. Universodon. Where we are at Twist Science, if you still say at, uh, we'll figure yes. it out. We'll yeah. have the young people figure it out. Where we are at Twist Science, and that's it. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes during the night, please let us know. Did, did we all drop Twitter and I missed it? <laughs> Twitter dropped Twitter. Didn't you hear? Well, Twitter yeah, well. stopped using Twitter. It's anyway. Um, it's also at Science, at Doctor Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. Just I'm still there sometimes. So if you want to tweet at me, I heard the um, whole thing we'll, got hacked. Yeah, well, we'll be back here in a couple weeks, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember. 
It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in 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 science, this week in science, this week in science, this week in science.